Go ahead. This is the call to, to call the order, the Wilmette Public Library Board of Trustees meeting for October 20th. The time now is 6.02. Can we have a call, roll call from Trustee Barshis? Jan, you're muted. Okay, I got it. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> and do you have two devices? I do. One for the agenda and one for, yeah. So it's now a ways away. All right, okay. one of them needs to be muted. Okay. okay. Trustee Parshis. Yes. Trustee Fishman. Here. Trustee Johnson. Here. Trustee Riddle. Here. Trustee Rogers. Here. Trustee Wolf. Here. Trustee McDonald. Here. Okay. At this time, we will just notice who we have as guest. Okay, um, so I'm seeing a few guests on our call this evening. Um, we have um, a represent. We have two representatives from the League of Women Voters. We're joined by Pamela Lurie and uh, Liz Seeger. Um, we are also joined by um, three staff members right now: Jessica Thompson, Gail Justman, and Marty Belfontaine. And we're also joined by um, our representative from Bibliotheca, Nathan Wunrau. Um, and as others enter the, the meeting, you'll see them in the participant list. So we've currently got 15 participants on the call. Okay, thank you. At this time, there's a time for, it's a time for public comment. Is there anyone, and you can just uh, raise your hands or send it in chat that would like to address the board at this time? Being none, are there any, and I'll say it one more time, are there any attendees that would like to address the board at this time? Being none, let us just do a review of the minutes from September 15th. Is there a motion to adopt the minutes? So moved. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded by uh, Trustee Barshis and seconded by Trustee Fishman to approve the minutes from the September 15, 2020 meeting. Is there any discussion? Being none, can we have um, a roll call to approve the minutes from the September? Sure. 2020 meeting. Trustee Barshas, yes. Trustee Fishman. Yes. Trustee Johnson. Yes. Trusty Riddle. Yes. Yes. Trusty Rogers. Okay. Trusty Rogers. Yes. Trusty Wolf. Yes. Trusty McDonald. Yes. At this time we're gonna hear the treasures. There are no presentations, and at this time, we're going to hear the treasurer's report. Trustee Rogers will go over the financial reports for September, as well as the bills and salaries. All right. Um, we received about $94,000 in real estate taxes, uh, $12,000 and change in general fund interest, and $41,573 in Kenilworth administration fees. Um, we are at 24% uh, of general fund expenses and the expected three month rate is 25%. So everything is pretty much as expected. Uh, there are a few items individually that show up earlier in the year and that's reflected in the, um, uh, the check detail, but um, there is nothing extraordinary uh, in that list. Um, any questions about the financial report uh, for September? 
Okay, um, I move approval of the bills and salaries for September. Uh, they are an attachment uh, in your board materials. Trustee Rogers has moved to approve I'll second. the bills and salaries. Trustee Wolf has seconded it. Is there any discussion regarding bills and salaries for September 2020? Okay, being, being no discussion, let's vote. It's been moved by Trustee Rogers. It's been seconded by Trustee Wolf to approve the September 20, 2020 bills and salaries. Trustee Barshis, can we have a roll call, please? Mm -hmm. Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? No. And I. <laughs> Okay. And you're cutting out. Yeah, you're out. You're cutting Trustee. out. Sorry, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. I I didn't hear a vote from Dan. I'm sorry. Did, did... he said no? That's okay. correct. Thank you. Trustee Riddle. Uh oh. Trustee Riddle, am I coming through? Yes, no. now you are. I'm going to abstain. Okay. okay. And Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. The motion passed with five yeses, one abstention, and one nay. Next on the agenda is the uh, action items, and we have a lot of contracts to review. And so we're going to turn it over to D Director Austin to give a brief overview, then we'll go over each one. Okay. okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's true. We've got a lot on the agenda to discuss tonight. So um, the first four items on our agenda relate to our capital projects. Um, as you know, um, in November of 2019, we um, approved an agreement with uh, Ingberg Anderson Associates to complete a capital reserve study. We received the results of that capital reserve study um, this summer and we reviewed that information and the information contained uh, a number of details that were priority that needed to be addressed, um, uh, some action items related to the building. Uh, and that's what, primarily what we're here to discuss this evening. The first two items on our agenda, A and B, um, attachments uh, four and five, uh, relate to um, the administrative services um, for the projects that are coming forward. The first um, item that we're going to discuss, um, and then we'll get into the details. I just want to give you a brief overview. Um, the first item on the agenda is um, an extension of the contract that we approved in January of 2019 uh, with Shales McNutt Construction for construction management services. Um, you may all recall, um, uh, sorry, I'm going to let uh, John Risco into the meeting here. Um, you may recall that uh, uh, Jason Perkunis was our construction manager on the outdoor renovation project, and Jason is available to, to serve as our construction manager on the projects that we're going to be bringing forward uh, this winter uh, for winter 21. So this is uh, that first item relates to the construction management services, and what that includes is um, preparing all of our documentation for public bid and uh, to manage the bidding process, as well as managing all the construction services, including um, scaling up all the skilled trades and coordinating the work that's being done. Uh, same services that, that Shales McNutt provided for us previously, uh, that's what's in this proposal here. Uh, the contract is identical, it's just being updated to reflect the scope of work that we're gonna be working on this winter. The next item on the agenda relates to Ingberg Anderson services. Now, Inger, Ingberg Anderson is going to be serving as our architect on this project. They're familiar with um, everything that we're talking about because they have uh, conducted the ca uh, capital reserve study and they're already kind of halfway down the road in identifying what the tasks are that we need to complete um, that are priority. So Ingberg Anderson has identified um, key items uh, that we need to address that are priority. We've discussed those in a previous um, finance committee meeting and at a previous board meeting. Um, the scope of work for this project is outlined in their proposal. The scope of work that we're discussing includes 
um, updating uh, the parking lot. That's one of our top priorities um, and one of the things that we're going to be looking at later in our agenda. We're also addressing an ongoing water infiltration issue and there's two locations that we're looking at uh, some leaks in the building that have been persistent for the past several years. The first of those is the curtain wall um, at the entrance of the library. So that's the, uh, if you can imagine where the magazine area is and the glass vestibule uh, main entrance on the west side of the building. When we refer to the curtain wall, it's that uh, glass and steel mullions uh, structure uh, that was part of the addition. Um, well, anyway, it, that's what we're talking about. There's water infiltration in that system. I'll get into that detail here in a moment. That's also on our agenda. The other tasks that have been identified from Ingberg Anderson that are priority with this project are included in their document behind attachment five. And those items include roof repair and replacement, tuck pointing, exterior sealant replacement, the replacement of branch panels and feeders in the lower level and first floor. That's the primary code issue that we need to resolve with our electrical panels. The main switchboard and associated features on the lower level also related to the electricity. The replacement of the fire alarm system, which is dated and wearing. The design and specifications for an access control system, which is essentially the replacement of our, our locking mechanisms on all of our doors, uh, bringing that up to the 21st century. And the design and specifications for a video surveillance system. And the final item that they're identifying is uh, repair selected sections of the permeable paver parking lot. So we'll get into that here in a moment. But um, the scope of work uh, that Ingberg Anderson is identifying um, is those items. And the services that they're providing include the architectural renderings that will be necessary in order for us to go out to bid on all these projects so that we can take advantage of the time that we have this winter um, during a, during a potential closure, uh, that's one of the things that we're estimating. Um, so getting this scaled up so that we're able to act uh, when we see that opportunity present itself um, is the reason why these are all being clustered together as a single project. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm at this point open to entertaining any questions that you may have about the scope of work, about any of these individual um, action items. And um, I think what we should do is just go through them, through them individually, uh, starting with our first agenda item there on, uh, on uh, section 6A, which is the contract renewal uh, extension with Shales McNutt Construction. I should also mention too, before we get into, into um, the action items related to this is that, um, uh, Trustees McDonald and Rogers met with me this past Saturday at the library to walk the grounds of the library and to go through um, the spaces that we're talking about on these projects. So um, they had a little bit of boots on the ground experience with the areas that we're discussing. Um, obviously, Ron's got a lot of longitudinal history with the library in terms of the various projects that we've done and uh, he can provide a bit more background about this too. Uh, but I'm happy to discuss at detail any of the things that we've got listed here. So the first item again is the Shales McNutt construction contract uh, extension. Can I ask a question if my uh, connection's pretty solid? Sorry. Yeah, you're, you're good right now, Dan. Sorry. Oh, good, thanks, I'm uh, good. Um, this is great. I'd love to see it. Could you just reassure me that the extension of the contract uh, complies with, uh, you know, competitive bidding and procurement code? Well, this is a, this is a, a professional service. So this one does not have to go out to, to bid. All right. So there's basically no procurement restrictions. We can hire whoever we want on the professional services. Service? That is correct. Well, the purpose of professional services contracts is when a situation exists in which the person you're engaging Thank you very much. knowledge of the building or the facility, and that's what this represents. I move that we approve the contract uh, on the moment, um, as stated with uh, our construction management firm. Uh, in the amount of 16215 uh, the services that will be concluded uh, by the end of January 2021. 
I second it, and uh, the re uh, I second the motion. Is there any other discussion? Trustee Riddle? I wanted to ask um, what the discussion entailed in within the Finance Committee, if, you could, if one could summarize that or help me understand what if there was any discussion or questions. Uh, this is not the Approval Finance Committee. This is, this is um, a product of our earlier discussions with the full board um, based on the capital needs study. And this is uh, uh, moving forward with the initial set of projects that were recommended in the capital needs study. Lisa, Lisa, one, were you going yeah, to say more? Yeah, and one of the reasons we chose Inberg is because they had they did the study, and so they have intimate knowledge of what needs to be done as part of that. And so they have helped us extensively on that. Are there any other questions or discussion? Okay, it's been moved by Trustee Rogers and seconded by Trustee McDonald to uh, approve the contract for Shales McNutt construction for $16,215 for interior renovation work. Can we have a roll call? Trustee Barshis? Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Riddle? I'll come back. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that was a yes? Yeah, she said yes. Okay. <laughs> Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. The motion passed unanimously. Okay. Could I just add the comment uh, that we had, since we had worked with the construction people and certainly with Jason before, and he was very, very good. So I think we are in good hands with that company and with Jason. Okay. Great. Thank you, Jan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the, the next item on the agenda is um, the uh, contract approval with Ingberg Anderson. Um, as I said, uh, Ingberg Anderson was retained for their help with the capital reserve study. Um, they have a deep knowledge of our organization um, and our building now as a result of that year-long study and identified a number of priority items. Um, this this uh, stage of their contract is a portion of it. Uh, the first portion of this contract relates to the actual um, the design phase. So this is um, the first step that we need to take is to create the documents that our bidders are going to be reviewing and then applying for. Um, so um, what we're looking at, uh, when you're looking at page two of this document, there's a table down there that shows a series of stages. Um, and those stages relate to um, the phases of the project that Ingberg Anderson is working on. This first stage is the drafting of the construction documents. So what we're looking at here primarily tonight or exclusively tonight is that column, which totals 21,500. Um, at this stage, I believe um, if, we, if we move forward with this, there will be um, another motion that we'll need to make at a future meeting that will um, take this to the next, to the next level. Um, so those other categories that you see that follow would be the necessary next steps that we would take from there. Um, but we're not making that, those decisions tonight. We are simply making the initial decision to create the drawings based upon the, the scope of work that was identified in the document before you. Okay, Anthony, on page two, the table shows the 21,500 is applying only to the preliminary design, creating Correct. the designs. Column two is construction documents, uh, and we're not uh, asking to approve that tonight. Correct. Uh, so, you know, we're actually looking at the preliminary design column uh, for 21,500. Uh, I move that we... Um, contract with Engberg Anderson for the preliminary design phase of the projects that are uh, in underway or in preparation. 
um, and a cost not to exceed twenty one thousand five hundred. I'll second that. It's been moved by Trustee Rogers and seconded by uh, Trustee Wolf that we approve the first stage of Ingberg Anderson in terms of preliminary design work for 21,500. Is there any discussion or questions? Trustee Riddle. My question is kind of in line with, with Dan's earlier. Are we aware that this is, um, this pricing is competitive? Are we aware that this pricing is are we receiving any special um, pricing um, as a client and as a really a long-term client of going forward? I think because they have institutional knowledge that you are, you've are, we've already paid for it when they did that capital study. And I think they know what's best and we're paying competitive rates with other uh, design firms. So in answer to your question, are we receiving any special rate? No, but I think they have institutional knowledge of Wilmette Public Library. But it will they're just doing the bid work. Eventually it will go out to competitive bid when you get to the final stage. So they're just administrating. Yeah, I understand, but we're not to exceed 21.5. We understand that these this fee schedule though is in line with you know, other, other. Their rates were up. So yeah, you had asked that, I think, when we were doing the uh, initial capital uh, study, the reserves, the capital study, looking at what the needs were for the library. But their rates were listed on the front and I think they're competitive. The pricing of, of this type of document is actually uh, specified by um, the AIA guidelines, the American Institute of Architects. Um, and so they're not exceeding what those guidelines are. Um, this represents um, standard pricing for um, these design services, the preparation of drawings that similarly will apply to the subsequent stages for construction documents, bidding and construction administration. Um, and so uh, there's nothing here that falls outside the guidelines that the AIA uh, standards represent. Um, detail of those standards are in the, um, are, are part of the Shales McNutt uh, definitions that we just approved. Um, you know, the, the, the provisions are quite detailed and represent uh, common practice uh, in uh, acquiring architectural and design services. Thank you, that's helpful. I, I think it's helpful to mention those things and I, li I like your responses, thank you. Any other questions? It's been moved and seconded. Can we have a roll call for the approval mm -hmm. of the Trustee contract? Fires. Okay, go on. Trustee Barshes, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. Okay, next is a uh, contract approval for LPS Pavement Company to restore and for the basically re restoration of the paving parking lot. And so do you wanna go, to, cause that probably won't happen till spring. And I think it's gonna need to be shut down for 10 days and it's not been taken care of or re refurbished since it was installed nine years ago. So trustee, I mean, Director Austin. Sure, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background here. So um, uh, it, it is true what, what Trustee McDonald just said. Um, the permeable paper parking lot has not had any uh, remediation done to it since its installation. Um, I do believe that it's, it's been our, our understanding from the Capital Reserve study that there would be some annual maintenance that we could take care of um, to help preserve the, the condition of the lot going forward. 
Um, so we're, we're certainly going to take those things under advisement now and uh, take better care of the lot. It's not to say we haven't taken good care of it, but um, it has fallen out of maintenance and that's why it needs this repair. So the scope of work that we're discussing right now relates primarily to the drive lane of the parking lot. And um, if you can imagine just an aerial view, well, there's a map, there's actually a, um, an aerial map of this on the attachment. So you can see the illustration that shows uh, primarily the far east end of the parking lot by where the book drops are. Uh, that's where the major wheel turn is in the parking lot, where everyone is kind of turning to go around those book drops to then uh, take the path back out towards the street. And what happens there where the wheels are turning constantly on those permeable pavers, it grinds those bricks down further into the, into the, um, the substrata. And what that does is it kind of, it pushes the bricks down and it, it also compacts uh, the base and it turns up all of the, uh, the infill stone that's in there. Uh, so what we need to do in order to remediate this and return it to its regular condition and avoid um, the further degradation of the parking lot, which includes broken pavers, um, eroding uh, substrata, as well as um, just general uh, conditions that get worse in the winter, unfortunately, where all these wheel turns are taking place. Um, it, it creates an icier condition and that, that contributes to slip trip fall hazards because we're not able to, to fully get up all of the debris in the winter time. So that's part of what this is all related to. Um, so what we're proposing or what the proposal is there is to take up the, the pavers the way that they are today, um, re-level the substrata and reinstall the bricks. We may need some new bricks and so we're accounting an allowance for that as well as then infilling additional gravel to compact them together a little bit more so that there isn't as much movement of the bricks going forward. And then there's some maintenance that we can do to this annually going forward. Um, additionally, there, um, we're due to restripe the parking lot so that the, uh, the parking spaces are more visible. Um, so there'll be an overall enhancement and beauty to the parking lot as a result of, of this work. Um, as Lisa indicated, uh, this is, this is going to be disruptive. It will require the parking lot to be closed because that entire um, westbound portion of the lot is going to be um, out of commission for approximately eight to ten days uh, while this project is going on. Now, as we indicated, we feel that there may be uh, a period of time in the future when the, the public library may be closed for uh, the pandemic again, or there could be some other conditions like weather related where the lot may be closed. Uh, this work cannot be done in the winter, um, but what we really need to do is to um, identify what the work is, which we've done here, and uh, get a contractor who is on board and ready to go at any time when we designate the work being ready to be completed. Uh, so what we're going to do and what this contract allows us to do is to keep this company on retainer so that when we have an opportunity to uh, pull the trigger and get the work done, um, when we see that there's an opportunity to do it uh, with the least impact to the public, we'll be able to do that. Uh, this pricing holds through the end of our fiscal year, uh, so we'll be able to complete this project anytime after the spring thaw. Uh, so that's kind of our plan there. Um, any, any questions or a motion? I'll motion to approve uh, moving ahead with this um, paving project. And I have a question to, before you do. Not to exceed the, a budget of um, uh, $33,000. All right. I, I see Dan's got a question. Let's take our second first and then we can get to Dan's question. Does anyone? I'll second the motion. All right. Thank you, Ron. So, so, so uh, Trustee Wolf has moved. So Trustee Rogers has seconded. Discussion? Dan? Thank you. Um, so if we if we started talking with the village and the post office um, about cooperating, you know, if we advanced in the last, I don't know, six months since we've last had this, uh, particularly because if we're going to shut it down, um, you know, that's a real opportunity to make sure we're partnered with the village and potentially the post office. So if we, if we had any of those conversations, and if not, is this sort of the perfect time to start having those conversations? Well, yes. Um, uh, so the first things first, I want to make sure everyone understands the library has two parking lots. Um, one, uh, one parking lot, the permeable paver lot that we're discussing here that's under this contract is the library's property. We own the permeable parking lot. Uh, the, the second parking lot that's primarily used by the staff is the village's parking lot that is shared by uh, the library. We lease spaces in that lot 
and the post office leases other spaces in that lot. And then any other available spaces are, av are open to the public. Um, so that's the village's property. So just to, to make sure that, that everyone understands where there's two parking lots here. Uh, obviously the impact would be if the public library is open when this uh, parking lot closure for uh, the permeable paper lot were to take place, there's gonna be some displacement of both staff and patrons in trying to access the building and it will be necessary for us to evaluate what other options we have for parking. Uh, our primary um, purpose is gonna be to, as we were with the outdoor renovation project, is to make sure that staff um, are not taking up the, the immediate uh, spaces that are closest to the building. We wanna make that convenience available to the public first. So we are gonna to need to find alternate locations for staff to park uh, during this time. And uh, we'll certainly wanna make sure that the post office uh, workers are parking in their designated spaces during this time and not parking in the library spaces. Um, that's a persistent issue and is a daily maintenance issue um, that will require some parking management assistance from the village um, if we're not able to coordinate better with the post office. Um, I, I will say it's been spotty uh, in our efforts to try to do that in the past, but we certainly need to ramp that up. So um, Dan's point's well taken. Um, there are certainly some impacts that are going to take place in accessibility and we'll want to make sure that we provide other spaces. That said, we're in kind of a, a, a tight area. Um, as there's development going on in downtown concurrent with this on Central, uh, that's mm -hmm. displacing some parking. Um, however, you all may remember during uh, the outdoor renovation project, the village was able to extend some parking along Green Bay uh, for staff. Um, I would certainly be open to exploring what our options are with the village there, um, in addition to the use of some of the other village parking lots, um, like such at the American Legion Hall and, and whatnot. So th I think there's some, some places where we would be able to, to relocate. Um, so no, we have a uh, short answer. No, we haven't begun that discussion, but as soon as we move into this uh, process, we'll certainly ramp up those discussions and come up with a plan for parking. All right, thank you. Would Just it be possible? I'm sorry, go ahead. What about, um, I know that there's, we rent spaces from the church. Would there be any other options to rent more space from the church across the street? Um, we could certainly look into that. The, uh, the west parking lot at St. John's um, is what Joan's referring to. Um, St. John's has also been generous with us on some other, other events in their main parking lot there may be some options for us there as well. Um, so yes, uh, it, I think we're gonna explore every possible option that we can uh, to, to keep uh, parking close and accessible. Anthony, do you wanna talk a little bit more how you landed on LPS pavement? Yeah, um, so this is a, you know, obviously a permeable, I'm sorry, I'm gonna mute you, Lisa, thank you. Um, this is a, a an area where um, we, we leaned on Shales McNutt. Um, they've got a lot of experience working with skilled labor and with um, special contracts. And because this lot is a little unique, uh, there are not a lot of these permeable lots like this out there. Um, Shales kind of leveraged their past experience and, and wanted to share um, uh, a contractor with us. So this, th they brought this, this uh, contractor to the table with us. And, um, and we were really satisfied with their proposal. I walked the lot with the consultant that went through and, and um, he gave us a number of different options for the proposal. Um, as you see, what, what, what I recommended to you all is the full adoption of their proposal. Uh, they did bring forward a couple alternates. Um, the initial price was, was a little less than what we're looking at. Um, um, but when I discussed this with the facilities staff, uh, we agreed that, that um, the closure of the lot is not something that we wanna do in, in phases over the course of, of time. We feel that if we're gonna do it right, we should do it right all at once and address these issues before they get to be uh, to worse uh, than they are right now. So um, you see in the alternates that there are, uh, there's an area um, that's kind of in between the wheel turn as well as the exit. Um, we felt it's gonna just get progressively worse. We wanted to in increase that as well as that manhole cover that was identified there kind of closer to the entrance. Um, that could continue to, to recede and we wanna make sure that that's taken care of. So we've elected to go forward with all of that uh, based upon the recommendations of Shales McNutt and this contractor. So no, I wasn't familiar with them previously. Um, Shales brought them to us and we've been really satisfied with our correspondence with them to date. So Anthony, has, have, they, has, have they suggested a different material for that turn 
in the parking lot that we have that where the book drop is. Yeah, it isn't so much a matter of the materials. It's just a okay. matter of the annual maintenance. So there's an infill gravel of a, of a certain grade that we need to that we need to put in there as the, the mm -hmm. papers settle. Uh, that's just an annual thing that we can do. It's just dumping a little bit more gravel on the lot each year to try to infill the places where it settles. So um, no, it's it's not. I think you know the the initial lot, the way it was proposed and installed, was great. It's an excellent solution. Um, but, but that said, it does require a bit of annual maintenance, and we just haven't been keeping up with that. So going forward, um, once we reset the, this after this project, we'll be able to do more annual maintenance on it. Okay. Um, I Havers, strict pavers in my driveway for over 15 years. There's a certain amount of maintenance that is required. Now, obviously, the uh, traffic in my driveway is mostly one vehicle. Uh, occasionally, my wife goes out wandering, but mostly it's my car going <laughs> back and forth. Um, the volume of traffic in the library lot is is many, many, many times more than that. Uh, I have my pavers pulled and reset. Um, in my system, it, the, the base is sand. Um, I have to have sand added and the pavers reset every three to five years. Uh, it's simply part of the maintenance. However, it greatly reduces um, icing, it greatly reduces other expenses. Uh, if we had gone nine years without maintaining asphalt or concrete, uh, the, mat, the lot would be a mess. The lot is passable, it simply has some maintenance issues that need to be addressed, and this is, this is normal. There's nothing, um, uh, you know, surprising about the need uh, to have this work done. Um, actually, the fact that we've gone nine years without doing any of the uh, refurbishing and resetting of the brick uh, is, is kind of surprising. That speaks well to the initial, the quality of the initial work. But uh, if you've ever stood in our parking lot and watched the volume of traffic going through past the book drops and for people coming to the library, um, it's enormous. And so, you know, the, the reality is that this is simply part of maintaining it, but it's a lot less difficult to maintain than asphalt or concrete would be. So, um, you know, I think this is, this is simply part of what we need to spend to keep the lot good shape. Okay, thanks, Trustee Rogers. Trustee Johnson, you had a question? Thank you, Madam President. Um, I, I, I love a lot. I think I'm all for maintain, maintaining it. I just think uh, I'd encourage Anthony to schedule a meeting with the village manager and the postmaster because uh, clearly we haven't really upgraded our shared property. And given that they've got a drive-through drop-off with the, you know, their mailboxes and we've got a drive-through drop-off with our, our library boxes, I think if we collaborate, we can come up with a better solution. So I'm, I'm all for moving forward, but I encourage you to schedule a meeting where we can at least start talking about upgrading the entire property. Thank you. We have had such discussions in the village in the past, and they've basically not been interested in cooperating with us to unify the lot to, being, to uh, um, provide joint maintenance. If they are willing to have such discussions in the future, we certainly can. But in the past, they simply haven't been willing to deal with that. And the fact is that the uh, existing um, village comprehensive plan calls for alternate use of the lot that they control. Um, in fact, it calls for turning it into park space. Um, that's not likely given the fact that the building on the other side of the alley from us wasn't in their long range plan, but the village really has to be willing to have that discussion before we're going to be able to affect any change. Um, the village owns the land, the land on which the drive through uh, for the postal drop boxes is located as well. So uh, the postal service really has very limited um, 
uh, ownership uh, of the property we're talking about, their property line stops before the drop boxes. Up to a year ago, they had no desire to get to to upgrade the parking lot or uh, sell it to us. What they gave us as a solution was the new building that was being built on the corner had some free public spaces and that they said we might could use that. That was their solution about a year ago. So appreciate the suggestion, but that's been addressed a couple of times. Is, is there any other discussion? Just one very small detail. I wondered if it were t if it were be possible to put small signs on the parking areas that are ours um, with the hours available, you know, for the for whatever hours the library is open. And we do. Um, they are. And uh, we there is something we did, uh, and we upgraded them as part of. Um, as part of our, our early COVID activity um, in April of this year, um, all those signs, um, they had kind of been worn um, and we updated all of those. So um, they, they're, they're bright and shiny and, and they, they certainly say what the expectation is for the period of time that we're leasing them. Um, so. Okay, yeah. good, thanks. Any other discussion? Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we approve the contract for LPS Pavement Company LPS company labor not to exceed $33,000 and it's good for this fiscal year. Can we have a vote? Trustee Barsis. Yes. Trustee Barsis. Yes. Trustee Fishman. Yes. Trustee Johnson. Yes. Trustee Johnson. He said yes. Oh, okay. Uh, Trustee Riddle. Yes. Trustee Rogers. Yeah. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. And uh, you now have the contract for Reliant Contract Glass Labor and Materials to assess and remediate the water leaks at the main entrance curtain wall and various other window elevations for an amount of 6800 Is there a motion to approve? I move that we approve the contract um, with Reliant Contract Glass uh, for the leak remediation work on the front curtain wall uh, and at other, other window low elevations as needed uh, in an amount not to exceed $7,000. I will second that. It's been moved and approved. It's been moved and seconded by Trustee Rogers and seconded, moved by Trustee Rogers, seconded by Trustee Wolf that we approve the Reliant Contract Glass contract not to exceed 7,000. Is there any discussion? Did you get a sense of what they would do, Lisa, at all when you went through or Anthony? Yeah, it, it, it there was, and, and Anthony can explain it better because I'm going to explain it in real layman terms, but okay. there were some uh, joints that were sealed that probably shouldn't have been sealed uh, as a way to correct what they thought was corrected and it caused a problem. But I want Anthony to give you a more technical explanation because it's beyond. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll try to keep it basic too. So, yeah. um, so basically, when, if you can imagine what that curtain wall looks like, um, it's a glass wall and then there's the steel frame that goes around it. The mm -hmm. steel frame, these steel mullions are, are hollow and they contain what are called weeps. They're intended uh. to funnel water through them. And mm -hmm. um, you may recall there was a period of time when um, the books down under portion of uh, the Friends bookstore would flood and we couldn't figure out why the heck the place kept flooding. And mm -hmm. so the, the solution was to look at that curtain wall that had been added recently um, above that, that vestibule space. And the solution at that time was to caulk and seal all of those weeps that were part of the original design to filter the water through them and then push it down to the lowest point, take it to grade and, and, and so on. 
Um, so what happened is we ended up clogging up the system, which forced the water to go elsewhere. And then that created uh, a leak that was harder for us to identify and find. Uh -huh. So what this company is gonna do is go through and make sure that the wall performs the way it was originally designed. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're hoping that that's gonna address the way that the water infiltration has been going through there. And, and they're pretty confident that they're gonna get to the bottom of it. Thanks. What you're basically going to do is to restore the original design um, I write the exams for the glass uh, doors, windows, and walls industry um, that, uh, that tests the standards that uh, manufacturers and their um, representatives uh, are required to meet. And part of the problem is that when you seal up openings that water is supposed to pass through, it finds its way through whatever means it can. Um, you never turn off the water. You simply redirect it to places that are harder to find. And that's what this repair is going to attempt to solve. Now, there is one other detail just to correct. Books Down Under was created at the same time as the vestibule. That was all one project. Uh, the basement level excavation to create the books down under space was part of the creation of the vestibule and the extension um, of what is, is now the periodical space. Um, all of that was done together. Uh, that curtain wall has presented some difficulties in the past. It, parts of it had been replaced. Um, over time, anything that was done that interfered with how it managed the flow of water simply moves the problem somewhere else. And so that's part of what this is, is attempting to address is to restore the proper drainage that's designed into uh, that system. There may be in the basement level that the curtain wall um, wasn't the source of, but with, it, it was what seemed to be a solution uh, at the time, it, it apparently wasn't. So, you know, that's work that might have to continue. And there is additional uh, water infiltration uh, uh, study that is underway that's going to address other issues that we have um, elsewhere in the library in addition to this space. So this is simply a restoration of the the, the drainage design that was originally a part of the curtain wall across the front of the library on Park Avenue. Okay, it's any other questions? It's been moved by Trustee Rogers and seconded by Trustee Wolf that we approve the contract for Reliant Contract Glass not to exceed 7,000. Can we have a vote roll call, Trustee? Mm -hmm. Trustee Barshes, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee yes. Trustee Little? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes, the motion passed unanimously. Uh, next, you've got the contract renewal for a complete cleaning company. There's a slight increase, but they've been with us for some time and they do a wonderful job and they've taken some extra precautions that they're doing during co the COVID crisis in terms of doing a little bit more cleaning. And I think uh, Director Austin can tell you a little bit about that. And that. Yeah, um, we, as I said, we've been very impressed with complete cleaning. Um, I've got past experience with them at another library and was very satisfied with them there. They do a great job for us at Wilmette. Um, they've been very serious in, in communicating with us throughout the whole pandemic process and enhancing their cleaning uh, procedures um, and adjusting their schedules to meet our schedule. Um, they've been great to work with. Um, the crew that, that specifically works with our, with our staff has been wonderful. Um, and as I've said to you all before, um, our account executive actually comes through on a regular basis and walks the floor of the building. 
um, to identify any issues that he may see. So he kind of double checks his, his staff's work um, in addition to the library staff doing the same. So um, I really feel that we get good results with them. Um, in my experience working with cleaning crews and cleaning companies, um, Complete has really been um, one of the better ones that I've dealt with. So I'm, I'm happy to bring forward this renewal to you this evening. I motion we approve uh, moving ahead with this contract uh, at a budget not to exceed $58,000. If that's my audio, I apologize. <laughs> Hope not. Is there a second? No, no second. second. Oh. Either way. Who's, who's seconding? Okay, you can, Trustee Fitch, we'll let, Okay, you can second the next one. Trustee uh, Barshi has seconded it. Trustee Wolf has uh, made the motion. Any other additional discussion? No. Does that contract, uh, I do have, does that contract for the amount because there are extra services that they offer that I don't know if you take that, you, that, that were in that contract, is that, does that amount cover all that needs to happen? Because you all listed, there were some extra services that they listed. Yeah, so com Complete Cleaning does um, offer a whole range of services. Um, what, what you're approving tonight is their regular maintenance of the building. Um, Complete also has historically done uh, the interior and exterior glass of the building. We do that on a, on a biannual basis. Um, they do that, but they do it under a separate agreement with us. It's not part of what's, what you're agreeing to here. So this is for the daily maintenance of the building. Any other discussion? We've had a number of years when they have uh, requested no price increase. Uh, and so, you know, a modest increase under the present circumstances is not, um, not a surprise. Um, you know, they, they say they've done excellent work for the library for a number of years. Okay. Any other discussion? Can we have a roll call to approve it? Mm -hmm. Trustee Barshis, yeah. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Sorry, back in time, yes. Is that a yes? Yes, he said yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, next is the RFID, which we've talked about quite a bit. And you've got the proposal, and there is a brief overview of it. Plus, you've got 50 pages of the proposal. <laughs> Would you like to say something, Trust Director Austin? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I want to reiterate again what um, what this process is. There's a lot of acronyms here, so I'm going to try to make it simple for everyone's purposes. Um, RFID, radio frequency identification, is a, is a method that we use in libraries to uh, manage the inventories of our collection. Essentially what this does is it places a radio frequency target inside of our items. Um, in retail environments, these um, same targets are used to manage inventory um, as a loss prevention measure. Um, in libraries, it's a way of adding some metadata to our collection in an effort to um, better track uh, the usage of our collections, um, to maintain an inventory of what's on the shelf, to um, maintain an inventory of what walks out the door uh, through the security gates that doesn't get checked out, uh, to handle items being checked out in general uh, to facilitate that process, as well as to facilitate the process of returning those items. Um, from an inventory standpoint, the exciting thing about this RFID process is that it allows us to do um, a better maintenance of our collections. Um, the, this, uh, this hand tool uh, that allows us to scan a shelf and determine if anything is out of order is a really modern way of doing the shelf reading that we're already doing. It is also a way to simultaneously identify um, usage of the collections and uh, for librarians to have a better sense of what their collections are when they're in the stacks uh, doing their collection uh, management duties. For circulation staff, um, this is the real benefit is that it, um, our current method of checking out is to open up our items, find the barcode and scan it um, as, as we do for each individual item. 
Uh, that takes a little bit more time for each transaction that we're doing with our patrons at the circulation desk. And uh, by having RFID targets in these items, um, you can simply stack those items on top of a digital pad. It reads everything that's on the pad and instantly checks it out to the patron without the repetitive motion. So it eliminates um, some ergonomic concerns with the day-to-day -day, uh, management of the collections for circulation purposes. When items are returned, an automated material handling system, an AMH, um, can do the same thing on the back end. Um, a conveyor belt system will receive the materials that are returned in the book drop, will identify which items belong in which collections, and will sort them into their respective bins. Um, so those are kind of the key elements of, of this particular project. Um, Wilmette Library has been considering an RFID system for an extended period of time. Um, for well, well over a decade, it's been in our resolution amending a plan as a special capital project uh, that we could tee up at any point. Um, when we were analyzing our opportunities, um, lo looking for potential projects that we could work on uh, during the pandemic, uh, particularly this winter, we identified this as a project that would be ripe for us to attend to right now for a number of reasons. One, um, as, this, as this project allows us to move towards a more contactless way of handling our collection um, in the middle of a pandemic, we thought that that was a great step for us to take. Uh, particularly with the check-in aspect when we're, we're quarantining our items for an extended period of time. Um, it also facilitates self-checkout, which would also be a great boon to um, our pandemic response plan. But even better, the actual labor for putting the targets in the, in the, in the collection um, is a very time-consuming process. And um, in, the, in a time period when we, when we may um, need to find special projects for part-time staff in the event that we need move back towards a stage like we were in early March um, through uh, June, uh, this would be an excellent project for us to, to get our staff engaged with managing the collection um, and putting the targets in the individual items. Um, some libraries would contract with a separate jobber to, to complete that labor. Um, we feel it's an advantage for us right now, just given the opportunity of this timing for our own staff to handle the collection. The added benefit of that is that the staff becomes even more familiar with our collections. Um, even better, we become aware um, if we have some potential collection management projects that we're working on simultaneously, we can run reports and the tagging software um, will identify an item that may be flagged for weeding or for another special project so that we don't inadvertently tag an item that doesn't need to be tagged. Um, so there's a number of opportunities that we thought were just an exceptional, um, that this was an exceptional project for us to work on. So um, given all of that, we, um, we put our package together and uh, posted our project to bid in late August. And we collected um, all of the bids that you see on that bid tabulation sheet. We're very impressed with the response that we received um, from um, the leading uh, RFID vendors uh, in the library world. Um, and we were particularly impressed with two of them, but one of them really stood out. And that's the one that's before you this evening. Um, as you know, back in, in May, we approved the purchase of two new self-checkout units for the library from Biblioteca. Those are the self-check 500 units um, that are currently installed by the, the former coffee bar um, in front of the recent arrivals area. And the second one um, was relocated from the circulation desk up to the youth services area. The one in youth services, um, we installed that just in the last month has been a huge success. Um, we're getting a lot of positive feedback from patrons that are using that saying it's far easier to use than our previous units. And um, it's actually the, the configuration of it makes it easier for patrons, um, even, even without the RFID in it currently, um, it's great for picture books. Just the shape of it uh, makes it easier for the circulation of those collections. The, the other units were just a little bit smaller. So anyway, um, the public's already familiar with, uh, with Biblioteca products. Um, I have experience working with Biblioteca at previous libraries I've worked at. Um, our neighbors to the north um, have, a, have, a, have a solution in place there um, at Winnetka Northfield. And that's kind of what opened up my, my consideration of the automated material handling system as that library is substantially smaller than ours. And I saw that they were able to fit an AMH in a very small space um, back a house there. When we um, initially put this project out to bid in August, um, Biblioteca uh, went the extra mile to win our business. Um, they actually were the only vendor that bid on our project that wanted to come out and do a physical site visit. 
And they brought out a consultant who measured the space that we were considering for the AMH and um, wanted to put together a proposal that was scalable to our space. Um, so you can see that I pulled that, that detail is on the second page of their pricing where they actually developed a schematic for what that system would look like. What's even more alluring to me about this system is that it's entirely modular. So we can adopt the system now in this space and going forward with any future renovation that we do, or if we decide that we wanna relocate this elsewhere, um, we'll be able to pick up that equipment and build onto it. Um, I love that. I think that's really cool. Um, it allows us to take advantage of this um, uh, unique technology today um, and grow into it over time. Uh, we wouldn't have to wait. The other solutions that were proposed um, were, I guess, you know, we certainly considered them as alternates and we probably would have, um, if we were to go with a different vendor, we wouldn't have gone with their automated material handling system because we knew it wouldn't have fit. Uh, but this one, this one does, and we're excited about that. Um, I was greatly impressed by Biblioteca's presentation. Um, they were one of two vendors that offered to provide a demonstration of their, of their proposal after it was submitted. And um, they answered a lot of questions for us and gave us references from other agencies. Uh, they are endorsed by Innovative Interfaces, uh, our vendor for Polaris, our integrated library system. Uh, so we know that it certainly is compatible with that. And a number of CCS member libraries like us um, have this system already in place. So patrons throughout the CCS system, as well as our own patrons, are familiar with this equipment in other libraries too. Uh, so for those reasons and the fact that Biblioteca was um, ultimately the low bidder on our project, uh, we were very satisfied with the results that they proposed. So um, at, this, at this point, um, they've got a, a, a really strong proposal. There are 150 pages behind this tab in your packet. Um, and uh, Gail Justman and I went through and we, we read all these proposals. Um, staff considered everything. And if you've got any, any questions about the particulars, the logistics, about anything that's included in this proposal, I would be more than happy to, uh, to address any of those questions at this time. Can the library stay in operation while the system's installed? Definitely, yep. Okay. Uh, I, I have a comment and a question. You've certainly done due diligence and, and um, you know, it's not a major chunk of change, but it's it's sizable. So um, I commend you and the staff for doing the uh, the due diligence that you needed. Um, I was just intrigued when you mentioned some sort of a conveyor belt uh, return. I, I envision the miles of conveyor belts that Amazon six miles I read recently. I know that's not the uh, the image I should have. But could you just briefly describe that? Just, I'm, I'm kind of curious. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I'm, Thank um, you. There, there are a couple illustrations. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen with you, um, if I can do that. Give me just a second here to figure this out. Because there are some illustrations in here, and I think that might help to tell the story a bit. All right. Can you all see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, so this, this illustration right here is of the automated material handling system. Um, so there are multiple bins on this. This one has seven bins. The one that we're, that we're looking at has three because the space that we're looking at is certainly small and can't accommodate six miles of conveyor belts. Um, <laughs> what, what is out of view on this screen is there's kind of like this dump area over here, which is where the conveyor belt system starts. So the return is, is over here on this side and the materials come into this, go up this conveyor belt. And then as the materials pass over these uh, rollers, uh, the computer at this stage here is telling it where each of these items is, is supposed to go. So for example, uh, one of these bins is probably designated for youth services, the second floor. One of these items is designated for adult nonfiction, the lower level. One of these bins is allocated for um, items that belong to other libraries like Evanston or Winnetka. And when the item passes over these rollers after it's gone over the computer, the computer tells the rollers which way to push the item. Uh, there's some illustrations that demonstrate this and it's really cool um, to see this thing in action. And in fact, the vendors have, have for, for all of these products are recommending that um, kids love them. 
And if you have the ability to put some kind of a glass wall in front of it so folks can watch it, it's really fun to see it all kind of in motion. Um, we really don't have the space to do that right now, but it's certainly a consideration to look at when we go forward um, with a project like this in the future. Um, so if you kind of scroll through the, their proposal, you're gonna see some other examples of the conveyor belt system. But what I wanted to show you here is the system that we're discussing right now. This was the one that was designed for us. Um, this wall here, where this black box is, is the, uh, the book drop um, on the west entrance of the library. So adjacent to the vestibule. Uh, these book drops are currently closed right now because the space is really occupied with all of our holds for, um, for circulation. This area is kind of a tight space. So we've kept this area closed right now. The primary returns for the library when the library is open um, are in the vestibule and in front of the, the circulation desk, as well as in the parking lot. And the parking lot drops are open 24 seven. If there were a way to put in some kind of an underground conveyance that would come into the library underneath the parking lot, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, that would be one way to adopt this system there. But for right now, we're just looking at, you know, what's attached to the building and this is the space that was, was designated. So here you can see the computer would be in this location and the rollers are right here. And we've got a bin for, you know, out of system materials, a bin for adult, a bin for youth or however we're gonna designate it. And then there's still this space over here for returns that would come directly from uh, the vestibule. Uh, kind of a tight space, so I imagine we would likely eliminate this. And at this time right now, we've already eliminated this during the pandemic. It just isn't um, an option for us. But uh, in any event, um, this, is, this is the solution that we're looking at. Um, if you go on, I would be more than happy to share with you some links of these things in action so you could see uh, some examples. Um, Biblioteca did give me uh, some videos and shared some examples from other libraries that are doing it. So. Um, I'd be happy to share that with you, but we're really excited about it. And I think the public's going to love it. And I know the staff is going to find that it's going to be a, a great convenience for them as well. Mm -hmm. uh, other, other questions or comments about the RFID? Just exactly. I'm not clear on where that machinery would be in our library. Yes. So um, you're standing at the front entrance outside the library by the flagpole. Mm -hmm. Um, on the entry plaza. Immediately to your left between the media room and the vestibule entrance are a series of three book drops that are attached to the building. Mm -hmm. This um, automated material handling system would link up with those book drops and would be installed in that circulation, kind of what we call the alley uh, behind the circulation desk. Uh it's a very small space. It is not something if we were to design it today, we certainly wouldn't design it the way that it is. Sure. Um, however- Anthony, I posted a photo of the front of the library if that helps. Oh, there, hey, look at that, Stuart rocks. Thank you. Um, <laughs> sure. yeah, so what we're talking about is, is right here, if you can see my, oh no, you can't, I'm not showing my screen. Should I point? Yeah, you, you can, let's see. Wow. If you can see the logo of the library, look at this, just a little bit, there you go. He's pointing right at it, that's it. So it's going to be right behind that. Very clever, Stuart. Thank you. <laughs> sure, happy to help. <laughs> Does that make sense, Jan? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so right there, those two inboxes that you can drop, you can drop stuff in. That's where they would, that was where yeah. we go. Yeah. So there will still be room, I assume, for the uh, uh, librarians behind the desk to pass each other without jumping over the machinery. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the space um, is not behind the circulation desk. It's in, in an adjacent area that kind of extends in a, what we call an alley. There's a narrow hallway behind okay. the circulation desk that connects with that west entrance. And that's, okay. uh, that's the area we're looking at. Okay. Sounds fun. Yeah. And for any of you who want to like a, a personal tour of that space, just let me know and I'd be happy to take you back there and show you what we're talking about in person. We first looked at a similar system with RFID and actually the library in Gurney, uh, we went up and visited there actually, a, a group of, uh, I think most of the trustees went up uh, at the time and viewed that, that was at least 12 years ago. Uh, in our tradition of not being the first to adopt uh, such technologies, um, we did not incorporate that into the next two library projects. Um, 
However, uh, one of the benefits of not being a first adopter is that the price of this system has come way down. Uh, it's a lot less expensive than what Gurney invested in it. And by now, Gurney's probably had to replace much of what they initially installed that we looked at. They had conveyors that actually allowed people to uh, feed materials they were returning into a conveyor system that carried it into the library and through a sorting system that, that took up a lot more space than we had available. And that's the reason we didn't pursue it at the time. But this is, um, you know, a, a step forward in how we handle materials and in making it easier to track uh, who has what and and getting it back into the library appropriately. So, you know, this is a step that we've had, as, as, as Anthony said, we've had it on our list, our to-do list uh, for many years. And uh, one of the benefits of not being a first adopter is that it's gonna cost us a lot less than it would have if we jumped on it 12 to 15 years ago. I move that we approve the contract for um, installation of the RFID uh, system from Biblioteca uh, with the uh, inc included support and, and hardware uh, for the price not to exceed $175,000. I'll second that. Um, I it's also eligible uh, as a capital expense uh, so this will very likely come on entirely out of reserve funds. That's correct. Trustee Rogers, what amount did you approve that for? 175. Okay, thank you. So Trustee Rogers has moved and Trustee Wolf has seconded the uh, purchase of the RFID system with supplies, equipment and support. Any other discussion? No, but we could probably sell tickets if we set it up right. Yeah. We can, you don't have we, enough we can do a double feature of that in the geothermal <laughs> um, processing going on. Okay. So can we have a vote? Roll call, please. Sure. Trustee Barshas, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf. Yes. Trustee McDonald. Yes. We're now switching over to the uh, to talk about the ordinance, and that was uh, you know what we talked about at the finance committee, and I think we brought it forward post that at the last uh, board meeting, and so we'll turn it over to uh, Trustee Rogers and Director Austin. Okay, what, the, what you see before us is a proposal to maintain the levy at the same amount as it has been for the last two years um, uh, with a, a zero increase in the amount of the levy. Um, this, as in the past two years, does represent uh, dipping uh, somewhat into our operating reserves. Um, the um, uh, but that's not a problem. Uh, we actually, when we get to reporting on the Finance Committee's deliberations, um, we'll also address the policies that are under consideration for uh, dealing with reserve funds. But for purposes of this action, what, we're, what the Finance Committee approved and is recommending is that we adopt the levy at the same amount as it has been for the last two years, um, which represents a zero increase. Um, there is some shifting in the allocation of funds, um, but the, um, the levy amount, the levy total amount uh, is the same. Uh, so I move approval of uh, the um, uh, levy for uh, the coming fiscal year uh, in the amount of $5,421.251. I'm sorry, $5,428,251. I'll second that. 
It's been moved by Trustee Rogers and seconded by Trustee Wolf that we do the levy at $5,428,000, $5,428,000. dollars reflecting a zero change in the tax levy discussion. Trustee Johnson. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I want to thank Director Austin. He uh, gave me very um, you know, great written answers to my questions. So I want to put that on the record. So I appreciate that, Anthony. Uh, I'm a no on this uh, for just one basic reason. It all has to do with the uh, amount of money that are in our operating funds and our capital reserve fund, to my judgment. They're both twice as big as they need to be. And if there was ever a year when we drained those funds and gave some property taxpayers some relief, it'd be in a pandemic economic recession year when people are gonna have the hardest time paying property taxes. So um, that's my statement and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Trustee Riddle. Yeah, I was wondering if there was any other modeling done with a decrease mainly. I'm, I think I'm also a no for this evening. Um, I wanted to know if in the committee there was any other modeling done for a decrease. We were looking at, and Trustee Rogers can answer, we were looking at making, uh, I think if you uh, have a, in terms of, so we would keep in the levy so that if we ever, it would not be reduced. And you can explain, I think three years, if they see a reduction in the levy, then you cannot raise, but I don't know the law per se. But we will yeah, you have a period of time where you can't raise it. Well, right. it averages, but sorry. Sorry. Were you going to continue? Lower it three years in a row. If you lower the levy three years in a row, then we, we lock in our, our, uh, our ceiling on what we can raise it if we need to do so in the future. Um, by holding it level right now, it gives us flexibility over the next three years to lower it based on conditions that uh, Trustee Johnson was just talking about. So from a, a practical standpoint, um, and someone else can speak on this if they want to as well, but my understanding is this is our best time to not lower the levy. And again, we are not raising the levy based on sensitivity of what's going on around COVID, um, but but at the same time to keep it to keep it level, to not raise it, but not to lower it is gonna be what's best for the library functioning and financing and thereby extension will therefore be the best way to serve the community to offer the services that the library has been doing and will continue to do so um, going forward. Uh, again, by next year, if things, if you know, COVID's not gonna go away tomorrow. Um, unfortunately, if you look at science, it's gonna be here for at least another year in a very impactful way. So come next year, when we have this discussion, by keeping the levy right now at its level without lowering it, we can lower it as much as we want next year and not penalize the library and again, not penalize the community. But you so that's why I feel very strongly about, I understand Trustee Johnson's concerns, but it belie I believe it's, it's not, the, it doesn't have the right foundation right now for what he's expressing based on the parameters under which we have to operate moving forward. Plus looking at the capital needs and how it's been defined going out the, the study we need we ha, we don't have quite enough for that and so we have slowly built up a reserve to take care of those needs and if you look at all the stuff that was passed today that we've approved that you can see a little bit as to a lot of it will happen probably in the next three years in terms of those uh and that's just basically maintaining the library. It's not any dramatic improvements, it's just maintenance and keeping the infrastructure up. Trustee Rogers, do you have something to say? Um, part of what we're looking at here is um, we represent 4% of the property tax in Wilmette. Um, the major responsibility we have to the residents of Wilmette is to maintain the library services that they have requested from us in our um, periodic long-range planning 
and in the requests for services that we get as we continue operations. Um, this budget does that. Um, we have from time to time uh, asked residents what services they want from us. That's what the long range planning process is about. Um, we have not needed to conduct a rate referendum since 2001 because of the careful management of the four to five percent of their taxes that the library has represented since that time. Um, and so uh, we've been very cautious and careful in managing resources. Uh, that's why we've been able to create the reserves that enable us to maintain the building um, and to maintain services um, at the levels that have been requested. Um, if there are special circumstances that require that we consider a different approach, uh, we'll certainly be able to do that um, in future years. Uh, but for right now, we have capital needs identified uh, that exceed the amount of our current reserves. And we want to be sure that we don't shortchange the ability to maintain the library to continue uh, to provide those services. So this levy does that. We will, over the course of the next year, uh, be um, adopting uh, additional uh, policies and updating our financial policies with respect to reserve funds. And we will take another look at this once we've had the opportunity for the board to uh, complete the consideration of those issues. The Finance Committee um, uh, has reviewed a part of these policies, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in this meeting, but we're not through with that process. Once the Finance Committee is complete, has completed this process, it will go to the Policy Committee and then to the board. So we have a number of things underway that are going to impact future years, but for right now, we're maintaining a flat levy uh, in order to make sure that we don't compromise our ability to keep the building safe and secure for staff and patrons. And just adding one more, th adding one more thing to what Trustee Rogers said. Um, I'd for like anybody to add to. Oh, anybody who's curious, um, on the Wilmette Library website, you can see a, a complete breakdown of where the ta how tax money is uh, is um, uh, is drawn, uh, how much tax money is drawn to each taxing body in Wilmette. Uh, and as Trustee Rogers said, it's 4% that goes to the library, which on a $15,500 real estate tax bill is a $600 amount from, from of, your, of your real estate tax amount. Trustee Riddle, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth discussing more. Um, I wasn't at the finance committee meeting and I think we've set ourselves up pretty well um, this year. Um, that we could afford a decrease um, in this in the levy, and I don't think it would um, I don't think it would hold us back next year or the year after um, with the capital expenses that we have. Um, you know, especially knowing that we just had the the um, Enberg Anderson um, report come back, and we're we're taking care of. I think the code and kind of like, you know, more emergency like capital costs now. Um, so that really, I don't think we were, I think we're set up. I think that we have the ability to reduce, um, reduce the levy here. Um, uh, you know, we're like an average household, and I'm just trying to speak for kind of the average, um, you know, working family here that um, I'm, we have a single income, we have children in remote learning. Right now, it's even really tough for me and my husband to stomach the property bill for, for because of the school um, percentage. And we're not even in school right now. I mean, we're using, um, very little of the school resources right now. 
Um, we're, our kids aren't in any specialty classes, Spanish, music. When you're in remote, you're very, you've got very little, um, you know, contact, I guess, and, and with, with the actual resources that District 39 can, can offer. Um, and going forward, already the Wilmette services, Wilmette usage, community usage of, of the library is down. And I don't expect it to, you know, uh, it could stay this at this level and maybe, maybe increase a bit, but I can't see it, you know, going back to its, you know, last year's level within the next two years. And I just think that this is the time to consider further discussion on this and probably a decrease. I don't think we're ready to vote on this. Thank you, uh, Trustee Riddle. Any other? comment. The motion is on the floor. It's been moved and seconded that we keep a uh, uh, the levy for a flat levy of 5,428,251,000. Can we have a roll call? Trustee Barshus? Yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? No. Trustee Riddle? No. Rusty Rogers? Yes. Rusty Wolf? Yes. Rusty McDonald? Yes. The motion, the levy passed. Uh, five in favor, two nays. I just want to add, I understand what Trustee Riddle's uh, concerns are, and I agree with everything you said, Trustee Riddle. Um, but again, keep in mind that the life, again, I'm not sure what your real estate taxes are. You don't have to disclose it. But for someone who, again, who has a $15,500 $15, real estate tax bill over the course of the year, the library amount is only $600. So that's not a, I mean, everything adds up. I understand that. But again, on top of that, we have a very important assessment year going forward in terms of the library. Um, as both Trustee Rogers and Library uh, Director Austin pointed out, um, with Enberg Anderson's um, uh, plan, we're going to be spending most of the capital reserve that we already have. Um, so what in my mind is a worse thing to do is to, first of all, if we lower the levy, then that becomes our ceiling going forward. We, I mean, we I disagree. No I disagree. I think we're set up. I think we're, I nope. think we're set up and I don't, I, I mean, if you would like to, if you wanted to discuss this more with me, we could have done it before the vote. And oh, sure. I'm, sure. I'm, I'm sensitive to your comments. I don't, what I'm saying, I don't, right? I don't yeah. feel like you're. Okay. This is a monologue. It, but... Moving on to the next topic. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Because we had the discussion and it motion passed. So it's the next topic. Which okay. Is... Okay. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is related to the last item that we did. The, um, so we passed a levy ordinance and this next bit is a formality that is our instructions to Cook County related to the action that we just took. And this is our resolution. Um, so this reinforces the action that we just took. So we'll entertain a motion to approve the resolution um, administering the levy. I motion we approve the the uh, the uh, this 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 um, next phase this next step. Okay. And I'll second. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded by moved by Trustee Wolf and seconded by Trustee Fishman to approve resolution 2020-21 slash 21-203 instructions to the Cook County Clerk regarding the Wilmet. Public Library District 2021 levy. Okay. What this motion does, is it instructs the county clerk to apply any limitation on the implementation of our levy to the corporate fund only and not to the special funds. The special funds are IMRF, uh, social Security, the audit fund, and there's a fourth one there that I'm forgetting at the moment. But the bottom line is these these are these funds are mandated by state law, and we instruct the county not to use the amounts of the levies in those special funds, 
and if there is a limitation that it be applied to the uh, general fund, corporate fund only. Thank you, Trustee Rogers. Trustee Johnson. Thank you, Madam President. Is this just like a legal formality we have to do with no real substantive yes. impact? Yes. Thank you, Madam yes. President. <laughs> yes, it is. So motion has been moved and approved. Can we have a vote roll call and discussion? Trustee Barshas, yes. Trustee Fishman. Uh, yes. Trustee Johnson. Yeah, it's a formality. I'm happy to vote yes. Trustee Riddle. Abstain. Trustee Rogers. Yes. Trustee Wolf. Yes. Trustee McDonald. Yes. The motion passed with uh, six yeas uh, and one abstention. And the next, I am hot mess today. Okay. So next up is uh, the holiday closing for calendar 2021, attachment 12. And is there a motion? And basically there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine paid holidays plus one staff institute day if it all ever opens up. Is there a motion to approve the Wilmette Public Library District 2021 calendar? I so move. Okay, Trustee Fishman has moved to approve it. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, Trustee Barcis has seconded the motion to approve the Wilmette Public Library District 2021 calendar. Any discussion? Let's have a roll call. Trustee Barcis. Trustee Barcis, yes. Rusty Fishman? Yes. Rusty Johnson? Yes. Rusty Riddle? Yes. Trusty Rogers? Yes. Trusty Wolf? Yes. Rusty McDonald? Yes. The motion passed. All in, with all in favor. Next is uh, the uh, basically board authorization of deputy election clerks for the local consolidated election, which will be held on Tuesday, April 6, 2021. Three trustees are, there are three incumbent trustees who term, whose terms are expiring, Trustee Johnson, Trustee Rogers, and Trustee Wolf. Uh, I signed the uh, granting, I signed the uh, document granting um, Permission, approval of having two, and I'm sitting up here looking for it. I missed my best. But, but is there an action item in terms of the board approving that? Well, I, this Anthony? is, yeah. So unfortunately, this should have been on the agenda um, for the September 15th meeting. The document is dated September 17th, and in an effort for staff to be able to serve as the deputy election clerks, we needed to take that action. So uh, Lisa took that action so that staff could um, create the candidate guides and make those guides available to the public who are interested in applying for these positions. Um, so um, in, in effect, that we need to do the formality of deputizing uh, the staff to fulfill that role that they've already been doing for the past couple of weeks. So if you could, if you could please um, just formalize the motion um, for what we're already doing, we'd appreciate it. Okay. So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. It's been so moved by Trustee Johnson and seconded by Trustee Barcis that we hereby authorize Nancy Jo Carroll, Marty Belafontaine, and Michael Boone to act as deputy clerks of the upcoming Board of Library, Tru uh, Library Trustees elections. Thank you. Okay. okay. We have a roll call. Mm hmm Trustee Barshas, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. The motion passed unanimously. Okay, now we have discussion items and we'll turn it over to Trustee Rogers to discuss the Finance Committee meeting held on October 5th. Okay, there was one item that uh, uh, did not involve the levy. 
uh, directly that uh, we discussed, and that is that the policy, uh, we're working toward adopting uh, or updating policy with respect to all financial um, uh, requirements for the library district. Uh, and one of those, the first one that we looked at has to do with what the reserve fund policy should be. Uh, on the advice of our attorney, uh, the finance committee is recommending that the policy be that the general fund reserves um, be uh, for uh, one year of, uh, of expenditures. Um, and so uh, that recommendation is going forward. There are additional requirements that the committee will evaluate in the financial policy draft that, um, that the committee has not yet seen or, or acted on um, once the Finance Committee has had the opportunity to receive and review those draft policies, it will then, um, uh, once the committee has approved it, uh, that will go to the Policy Committee and then on to the board. So, uh, but what we're recommending uh, is that the reserve, uh, the general fund reserves be set at one year of, of expenditures. Um, which is consistent with the recommendation from our attorney. Uh, that will at some point uh, probably involve transferring some funds from the general fund to our building and equipment reserve fund, um, uh, which will have been spent down somewhat by the projects that were just beginning. Um, and so, you know, we'll have more information or more detail about these things in the future. Uh, but the, the one detail in, the, in terms of the committee's action was to recommend uh, to, uh, to incorporate into our finance policies the one-year reserve in the general fund. Madam President, is that time for discussion? Okay, discussion. So I think it's great that we're finally getting a written policy, um, but the idea that we need $6 million in the bank, you know, that's the reason why I voted against the levy. You know, the reason why we've been critiqued as having the bankable med is that that fund is one of our major problems is that there just isn't a justification to have that much money in the bank. So I'm glad that the conversation's moving forward. Uh, but as I read the Civic Federation's report, they suggested three months would be appropriate for local government like us, because we can levy whatever we want, you know? So the justification for $6 million in the bank, to me, there just isn't one, which is why, uh, and that informs the tax policy debate. So appreciate the discussion, and uh, it's nice to crystallize the conversation. And by the way, the, uh, the legal recommendation, I, I'm concerned, I'm glad that we're gonna get under the tax objection limit, because if we get too high, you know, somebody can file a tax objection. But I, I hope as the conversation progresses, we can move it to a, a three or a six month instead of a 12 month. Thank you. Trustee Johnson, you'll get to weigh in on that. You can come to a finance policy committee meeting and when it comes before it. But I think most libraries keep between six months and a year based on, uh, I think there also may be some confusion on the part of the Civic Federation um, in those recommendations. We do not have the authority to simply levy whatever amount that we might want. Um, the reality is that under the tax cap, uh, we have si significant limitations. We are not a home rule body as the village is um, and as larger municipalities are. Uh, their recommendation might make sense in a home rule district. It makes a lot less sense in a, uh, a municipality that doesn't qualify to, to the exemptions under the tax cap. Um, and so um, we can have further discussion on the issue, but um, I don't know of any uh, public body that is subject to the limitations of the tax cap that is routinely able to manage on a three month reserve. 
Um, you know, the, that just doesn't make any sense. Um, there are contingencies that can occur. There are emergencies that can occur that, that might make that uh, a real crisis for um, a small unit of government that does not have unlimited levy capacity as we, uh, as we do under the, you know, we do not have those, you know, we do not have that kind of, of capacity to be able to simply levy whatever we need or want. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Rogers. It should be a interesting discussion when it comes before the board. Uh, we've got chapter 11 of the and uh, which deals with youth and young adult services as part of Anthony's uh, campaign to make sure that the trustees are qualified. And we were lucky to have Ms. Johnson, uh, youth services manager, speak with us last month. Does anybody have any additional questions or comments regarding this policy? Well, just uh, I want to be clear about one thing. Um, so the, the purpose behind these chapter reviews is to, um, for one thing, for the board to be aware of what the, the standards are for Illinois Public Libraries. So that's the document that we're reviewing. Um, this is also one of the requirements for our application of the per capita grant. Um, there's an item later in the, in the agenda that I just, I'll just cover right now. It's under the informational items. October is typically the month in which I would present to you our per capita grant application. Um, to date, the State Library has not put together the requirements for our per capita grant application. Um, we anticipate that that will be coming up um, in the coming month or two. Uh, however, we've got on good word that our requirement um, is to, before the board, review every chapter of the standards. And so that's what we've been doing since I got that word. Um, we've been taking some time each month to go through this guide chapter by chapter. And so we've made it as far as chapter 11 now. And uh, as uh, Trustee McDonald indicated, yes, last month, um, Andrea Johnson, our youth services manager came and uh, shared a number of these points with us, illustrating the ways in which the library is meeting these standards and exceeding them. Um, I could go on at great length about this, but that's not the point um, tonight, so especially as we've got a lot of stuff to discuss here. So does anyone have any questions about anything specific in uh, these standards or anything you'd like me to touch upon? Um, if not in front of the meeting, um, it, feel free to reach out to me as always anytime and we can talk about this stuff in greater detail. <laughs> Okay, so the next item on the agenda is our uh, monthly update on our pandemic response plan. Um, so the, the news uh, today is um, that the governor has issued some uh, additional restrictions to the collar counties around Chicagoland as we're starting to see our uh, COVID numbers starting to increase. Um, yesterday, um, Mayor Lightfoot uh, spoke as well about um, the, the, the idea or notion that we're going to have to uh, make some further adjustments within Chicagoland. There haven't been any changes that are proposed for Region 10, which is suburban Cook County, which is the region that we fall under. Um, however, staff and I are discussing what the next phases mean. As you're all aware, um, we have been doing a, a community survey um, online uh, this past month and collecting feedback from our patrons about a, a number of our programs and services, our hours, our COVID response, um, the whole scope of services that we're offering. Um, and in trying to adapt our services to meet the needs of the community, we're also simultaneously looking at these figures. And as has been our practice since March and, and prior to our decision to close the library due to the pandemic, um, we're taking all of our steps out of an abundance of caution. Now this evening, I might very well have come to you and said, hey, uh, you know, this would, this would be a great time for us to either expand our hours, to offer some new services, um, to consider a different programming model, uh, that said, um, looking at the, at the figures that we're seeing right now, this just does not seem like a moment for us to be making a shift um, to plan ahead a couple weeks to be, you know, expanding our services when we very well might see ourselves at that same time being told to contract our services. So I think the point of this conversation tonight is to illustrate um, what our plan is going forward. 
So in the event uh, that we see some further restrictions that are imposed upon us, um, I think it's an important distinction for me to note that there hasn't been specifications uh, clearly delineated for public libraries. Um, we've largely been left out of this conversation and we've kind of had to be on our own um, and kind of develop our own plans. Um, I think speaking on behalf of all libraries, I think that's made it very challenging, but I think public libraries have really risen to the occasion. Um, and for the most part, all libraries are open right now and a number of them are operating um, fairly successfully. Our figures are indicate that our patrons are satisfied with the services that they're receiving as our circulation is only down 4% from what it was last year. Obviously our door counts are down, um, but I think that's a reflection of our community's understanding that we are in a pandemic and folks are still taking advantage of either parking lot pickup or they're using digital services or trying to get their services you know, with any of our modified uh, methods. Um, so what does it look like if the library does have to move um, back a step? And we've talked about this a bit before, but I want to refresh everyone about where we're at with this. So in March, when the numbers were spiking and we were all um, encouraged to close, and we did so in partnership with all the other village agencies. Um, we did so with the schools, with the village, uh, the park district, et cetera. Um, today, if uh, there were some, if we were to move into a different tier or phase um, and have to relax or, or roll back rather some of our services, what would that mean? I think it's different than it was in March. I don't think at this stage it would mean that the library would have to physically close the building. Um, I think it would mean that we'd have to analyze the ways in which we're providing our services. We need to keep people safe. And I think we're doing that. We're already doing that through social distancing, through capacity limits, through barriers, uh, through limiting access to certain services by uh, removing seating, uh, encouraging people to come in and get their business done and move on. Um, the science that we understand suggests that the pandemic is, um, is a respiratory virus that is spread through droplets in the air. Um, there is not any substantial evidence to suggest that the virus is passing on physical objects. We're gonna to continue to quarantine our materials and we're doing so with the suggestion of the best science that's available to us. Um, however, I don't think that, we're, that um, if we were to move back a step, that it would necessarily mean that, that we're going to be closing the building altogether or that we, we would be sending our staff home altogether. Uh, I don't think that's where we're at right now. Now that said, uh, if these numbers do increase radically and if we see a local outbreak, then that would prompt a, a completely different response. And we're, we're prepared to do that as well. Now we have the infrastructure in place. We have the methods where we can do parking lot pickup, where we can expand our delivery services, uh, where we can provide other means. Um, we've already developed these means. We've already developed ways that we can provide our services. So I don't think that we need the time uh, in a closed environment to develop the services that, are, that we've already been using for the last six months. So we're just, I think, you know, long story short, I think we're looking at these numbers cautiously. And um, at this stage, I feel comfortable with the methods that we're using um, and we'll continue to study them. But I don't think that we're seeing a closure of the library as an imminent step, um, even as we're seeing the impacts on some local businesses, primarily restaurants being told that they need to alter their methods uh, of their service. So for right now, here on October 20th, um, I think it's business as, uh, new normal <laughs> uh, for the time being. Um, but I'm happy to entertain any questions about some specifics if there's some things on your mind that you'd like to discuss. Briefly, did we, uh, on the delivery thing, did we get the hybrid? We did. Um, so thank you, Dan. Yes. Um, at, the, at our last meeting, uh, the board did approve that we move forward with the purchase of the vehicle. So we did purchase a vehicle. Um, I shared that information with the board um, uh, right after we purchased the car um, uh, at our purchase price um, was, was uh, at 42000 and change. Um, so we got a good deal on the vehicle and it is here in the parking lot. The charging station was installed this past week and um, staff right now are developing their procedures and getting prepared to train on how to use this new what we're calling spaceship. Um, it's really weird. The cockpit of this van is, is quite different than what uh, a lot of us are used to driving. It's, it's, it's very technology forward and a lot of things to kind of distract you as you're driving. So 
anyone who's gonna be driving that vehicle, we're gonna send them through a little bit of a training program so they all know how to use it before they hit the streets with it. Um, the vehicle, as, I, as we discussed previously, is gonna be used for a number of purposes. Uh, the purposes relate to outreach and community engagement purposes, as well as delivery um, uh, to patrons, uh, partner agencies like preschools and schools, um, and the park districts, as well as being used as a, um, a vehicle that we can collect our remote book drops. We've been, we've been talking for a time about when it will be appropriate for us to open the remote book drops. Uh, one of the contingencies that I've talked about there is the hire of our facilities manager. We've been down some staff and it's been difficult for us to scale up appropriately uh, to offer that service again. I think we're, we're getting close. Um, as, I, as I'll report here in a moment, we've filled our position for our facilities manager. So that was a, that's a critical step. Um, he'll be starting in his role in the middle of November. Uh, so we've got a few weeks ahead of us yet before we're fully staffed in the department. Um, that said, as we're looking at the rise in numbers, um, it's, it, we kind of need, need to be thinking, is this the appropriate time for us to reopen those book drops? Um, but once, once we get that new staff member in place, um, that will give us more space and time uh, to be able to go out and retrieve those if in fact uh, we do reopen them. And I think, it, I think at that time, we'll be able to make a better decision based upon our resources. Uh, but the vehicle itself um, will go into service for delivery purposes um, in the next several weeks once we get the staff trained on that. Um, we are still uh, d designing the, um, uh, the wrap as we've talked about, we want to try to beautify this thing and brand it as being a library vehicle. Uh, staff is, is, uh, has begun that process and is working with a vendor um, to, uh, to get the vehicle wrapped. So um, hopefully by this time uh, next month, I'll be able to report on that and or share uh, the, the new vehicle. Uh, so stay tuned. I'll have more information to share with you at that time. Um, other, other questions about the pandemic or the library's response to thereof? I think I made a suggestion that uh, at some point that the idea that the vehicle that you have is a hybrid could be highlighted somehow so people would realize that that was what the vehicle was. So I think that's important for those of us who are interested in air quality and everything else like that <clears throat> in the environment. Thank you, Jan. Yep, we will incorporate that. Thanks. Other questions or comments about the library's pandemic response plan? Can we move on to your annual, your report? Okay, thank you. <laughs> we are getting on to eight o'clock here. Thank you all for, for sticking around and for your patience with all of our business tonight. I will try to keep my report brief and leave it open for your questions. Um, still a lot going on in the library as I indicated. Um, our circulation is still performing incredibly strongly. Um, we are just 4% below where we were uh, this time last year. Um, that reflects a high, level, a high level of engagement with our collections from the public. Um, our ebook e collections um, are starting to kind of level off a little bit in terms of circulation. Um, about 50% increase over where we were um, earlier this year. Um, we're seeing more folks are checking out physical materials now than the digital. So. Um, I think it worked well for folks who weren't coming in the building, uh, but now that folks have open uh, browsing inside the building, we're seeing more of that kind of traffic and, and browsing here. Um, anecdotally, I would say that there, there have been in, in the last couple of weeks, more people coming in the building who are visiting us for the first time uh, in many months. Uh, some, um, uh, I, I've heard about some folks coming into youth services recently who have not been in the library since we um, reopened in uh, June. So that's kind of, uh, that's been interesting um, to, to, to see those folks and to reintroduce them to our services. Um, the community survey data, um, I wanted to comment on that briefly. Um, it's still in progress. The, the survey is still out there. It's on the front page of our website. If you've not already completed the survey, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we've gotten 400 and some responses to date. Um, overwhelmingly, uh, the, the data right now suggests that patrons are really satisfied with the virtual services that they're receiving. Um, although about half of the patrons who responded to the survey indicate that they do not attend programming, period. The overwhelming majority 
of those who, who do um, attend programming learn about all of our services online. In fact, we were surprised in the data that suggests that more folks are enjoying digital newsletters and the frequency with which we're sending out our e-blasts uh, than the print newsletter. And that's a bit of a shift from some of the data that we've received in past surveys that we've done, where we've relied upon the print newsletter as our primary communication tool. Um, so we're, we're really looking to re-engage with folks um, uh, digitally. We do want to continue to use mailings. Uh, I'm sure you've received a few postcards recently advertising some of our events. We're still going to use that as a method to, uh, to connect with folks. Um, however, we do not foresee um, offering a print newsletter as we did this time last year. I think until we've um, got a better handle on what our programming options are going to be physically uh, going forward. So I think the newsletter is going to be on hold for a while. I see Jan's got our Arshay Cooper newsletter in front of her, or postcard in front of her there. Yes. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll get to that here in a second too. Um, so a couple other details I want to share with you from my report. Um, we're excited this week, uh, District 39 is starting a soft rollout of the Overdrive Sora project. I talked about this previously. This is a partnership between D39 and the library um, where uh, D39 is now launching an Overdrive ebook platform for their students uh, that supports the curriculum. Uh, in our partnership, what that does is for residents um, uh, and students of D39, they're simultaneously able to get access to the library's Overdrive collections um, with their D39 registration. Uh, so we're excited about that. As I said, it's a soft rollout. Um, not all the students have been trained on it internally, but that's a process that they're going through. Um, it is going to be introduced at the, the board meeting for D39 um, later this month. Uh, so the, that board and staff will formally get that introduction at that time. Um, I'll be tuning in to hear um, what Tony DeMonte has to say about it um, at that meeting. Um, so we're excited about that and uh, we're, we're interested to see what those impacts are going to be and, and what kind of increase in usage we're going to see for our youth collections as a result of that. Um, speaking of our digital resources for kids, we have a special page that's dedicated to um, homework help on our website and I'm going to share this very briefly with you so you can see this page. Um, technology. Here we go. So this is our homework help page. And on the homework help page, you can see that we've got a new product called Scholastic Teachables, which offers print worksheets, lesson plans, reading passages, and fun activities for elementary subjects, including math, science, reading comprehension, writing, and more. Uh, this is a product that a lot of um, parents have been asking for by name. And we're thrilled to be able to offer this along with our host of other uh, resources that are helping to support at-home learning including BrainFuse, which is another one that's been really popular um, this fall. We've seen an uptick in usage of BrainFuse. That is a free live tutoring service that's available from 2 p.m. to 11 p.m. Um, where you can get live homework help. Uh, so do check out the homework help pages. While I'm sharing my screen, I'll also share with you our new story times page. Uh, so our virtual story times have been um, have just ramped up this past week with live story times. Um, as I mentioned at the last meeting, we've been extending our, our uh, parents on our parent survey for summer reading indicated that they wanted to see more live programming. Uh, so that's what our youth staff have been working on a lot lately. Um, you can see our schedule there for story times. And then you can also see that we've got an archive of all of our videos that's being posted. And that first one there is from Andrea for Baby Time. And that was recorded just earlier today. So that was a live presentation and has been archived and is displayed now on our website. Um, as you scroll down, you see all the programs. Gosh, there's so much creativity going on with our staff. Um, you can access all of our Storytime playlists and everything that's been archived beyond the most current ones by clicking through to our Facebook Storytime playlist and YouTube uh, Storytimes as well. So that's the story with those items. Um, what else no. did it say? Go, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dan. No pun intended. Okay. Oh, you just said that's a story with that item. Nope. Um, and I was just wondering if those two uh, trustees with young children have used these resources, Fina or Dan? 
Pun intended. Joan, not yet. Um, it's a good question. I'm excited about the District 39 integration stuff. And if, um, I don't know if you've met Billy Dennis, who's the tech guy over at D39, Anthony, he'd probably be worth talking to as well. Um, but um, not yet. Thank you, though. And then I don't know if you heard me. I tried to make a joke that, uh, no pun intended, that that was a story on those items, Anthony. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I love a good pun. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, a couple other items I can share with you here briefly. Um, gosh, I, I don't, I've got so many things I'd love to tell you about about the library, but I know it's getting late. I would like to get to your questions. So let me just do that. I'm going to press pause on my, on my talk and you talk to me. Um, what do you want to know about what's happening? Is there anything that you saw in my report that you'd like additional detail on? Anything that you would like me to pull out and, and discuss a little bit more uh, for you all? Uh, this is just a comment. I am so impressed by the two upcoming programs, the one tomorrow night and then the one in uh, November. Thank you. So let me yeah, let me, let me talk a little bit about those. Those are clearly okay. some items I'd like to talk yeah. a bit about. Thank you. Yeah, so um, uh, the, the first item is uh, an event tomorrow night. This is our very first virtual author event. Um, each fall for the last 15 years, we've been hosting Meet the Author. And um, last fall, we had Susan Orlean. And um, this fall, we have Arshay Cooper. Um, you can see Stuart is showing us um, his background is the cover of Arshay Cooper's book, um, A Most Beautiful Thing, which is the subject of, of tomorrow night's Zoom meeting at 7 p.m. We have 450 people registered for this event, um, wow. and we are partnering uh, with Semicolon Books um, on the, the Near North Side, which is a uh, Black woman-owned bookstore uh, that's working with us to provide copies of the book. Um, and they're providing signed book plates from Arshay Cooper as well. Um, there's a really excellent documentary film that accompanies his, his wonderful memoir um, about the first all-black high school rowing team at Manly High on the west side. Um, Arshay's story is amazing, and um, the documentary is, is just so captivating. I watched it last night, and I actually am looking forward to seeing it again. Um, a really well done piece. And since this is about Chicagoland, um, it's really wonderful to see our city and to learn more about uh, the people right here in our community. Um, obviously, as rowing is, is of, um, of interest to our immediate community up here, it's very popular in New Trier. Um, we know that there's already a lot of interest um, uh, with folks here locally. Uh, so we're thrilled about Arshay Cooper's uh, event tomorrow. I encourage you all to, to tune in and, and check it out. Um, we're also excited uh, on November 9th, which is a Monday night, um, we're partnering with 10 other libraries to host uh, Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, um, who's the number one New York Times uh, bestselling author of How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, we've featured his materials previously, and um, he has, he's been to our region uh, before. He, was been a, um, he hosted an event, or a FAN, the Family Action Network, hosted an event with him um, last year. And he's a wonderful speaker, and we're all thrilled to be able to bring him forward uh, for, all, for all of our library communities. We've got thousands of people registered for this event already. Um, so if you're interested in attending that, that's going to be a wonderful conversation. Um, and uh, we encourage you to tune in for that. Information about all this is in my packet as well as on our webpage. Anthony, one question. Oh, oh, oh go ahead. Anthony, will you be videotaping uh, the rowing video? If you can look yeah, um, on the website, do you have the rights to do that? We're working out those details. Uh, we will be recording the event. Um, however, the way that we publicize or the way that we um, promote that video that we record um, is still kind of up in the air at the moment. So I don't know if that's going to end up on our YouTube page or on our web page or, or whatnot, but it, it will be recorded. Okay. And how are you going to handle, are you going to have a Q&A section? Yes, okay. we are. Um, so uh, patrons who have, who would like to ask Arshay direct questions can do so. There's a, uh, there's a Q&A portion in Zoom. Um, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom um, chat panel right now, you'll see that there's a, there's a chat button. Um, in that same location, there'll be a Q&A button. And then you can directly type in your question there, and then that will go to the moderators. 
And the moderators will then go through and make sure that those questions, they'll kind of cluster similar questions together um, and then help present those to our speaker. So it will be interactive. Do you plan on showing his movie? Um, we, we don't have plans for that initially. However, it is free to stream right now via the Peacock app um, on the NBC app. Um, so that might be on your smart TV or is certainly available on your phone. Um, and then you can, you know, cast it to your TV. Uh, definitely worth checking out. As I said before, I loved it. Other questions about either of those two events? Um, Stuart? I, I was uh, actually, um, uh, Trustee McDonald asked the question I was going to ask both about tomorrow night's event and for Dr. Kendi, will those be available to library patrons if they can't attend on the, during the live portion? So Yeah, and um, we are not the, the, the primary coordinator for the, the Kendi event. Um, however, um, I anticipate that that will be recorded and available. Thank you. I could um, just affirm that both of those books are really worth reading. And uh, I learned a lot from Arshay Cooper's book. Uh, he's a good writer and the story flows very well. And I've read some of the How to Be an Anti-Racist and that one really makes you think too. A lot of good stuff there. All right, were there any other points in my report that you wanted me to go over specifically? Um, or anything that caught your eye? Hmm. All right, then I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, I, I will say, um, uh, I wanna give you an update briefly on staffing. I said I would do that. So um, there, the, the library has, um, due to the pandemic, has seen some unprecedented times in the last several months. Um, and, uh, I'm not, I'm not looking for, for anyone to kind of pat me on the back right now and tell me everything's going to be okay, but I, I will say this has been an unusual time for us and, um, and, and my HR manager, Mike Boone. Um, we have been working pretty hard to make sure that the staff is taken care of, and uh, there have been a lot of challenges thrown at us. One of the great benefits of this organization is the fact that it takes really good care of its staff, and because of that, um, we've had a very loyal staff for a long time. Um, the average tenure of our team until recently has been well over 20 years. And because of that, a number of folks come to work for Wilmot Library and they choose to stay here through their retirement. And when I say through their retirement, I mean that too. They retire from the library and then they continue to work with us. Um, but what's happened this year is we've seen quite a wave of retirements. Um, and that's had a big impact. And that impact especially has hit our leadership team. In fact, the, the leadership team has largely turned over in just the time that I've been here, primarily due to retirements. Um, so I just want to kind of paint that picture for you briefly. You may recall when I first started here, my first task was to hire a youth services manager, and that's what brought in Andrea Johnson. Um, this, this spring, in February, our finance manager, Barbara Griffiths, retired. Then our adult services manager, Betty Griffiths, uh, I'm sorry, Betty Georgie, retired. Um, then two of our senior librarians who had been here for collectively over 70 years retired. Um, our circulation manager retired in July. Our office manager, Cynthia, retired at that time as well. She was my admin. In August, our facilities manager retired. And just now, our technical services manager and IT manager, Gail Justman, has announced her retirement. Uh -huh. So we've got a, quite a lot of turnover. Yeah, there's Marty's reaction. That's a perfect reaction. <laughs> um, the good news is that um, Gail has agreed to, uh, to stay on with us. Um, part of the motivation for, I think, some of these recent retirements, um, this also affects our uh, assistant manager for adult services, Nancy Wagner, is also going to be retiring too. Um, uh, IMRF, our retirement fund, has made some changes, uh, and that's kind of driving uh, these last two points that I've been, uh, individuals I've been talking about. Um, for folks who, who retire after January, um, they're no longer, a, after they draw from their retirement fund, they're no longer able to work for an IMRF employer. Now, that's something they were able to do historically. 
Uh, so these two retirements that are, that are hitting us right now, um, both individuals intend to continue working with us past their retirement at the end of November. Um, so that's great. Nancy will continue to be a part-time librarian in adult services. Um, she'll give up her role as assistant manager and um, we will be posting for that here shortly. Uh, Gail is going to give up her responsibilities as TS and IT manager. Um, however, she will continue to work with us um, going forward and help to fulfill uh, a number of other tasks for us going forward because she is a font of knowledge and experience for us. Uh, so we're grateful for that, um, but we're certainly grieving the loss of our team. Um, that said, um, we did recently welcome a new face to the library. Our new circulation manager, um, Kim Hegeland, started um, last Monday and um, she's wonderful. I, I hope the, the next time you come in the building that you'll look for Kim and, and meet her. She comes to us from the Evanston Library. She has a, a lot of retail background. We talked about her last month. She's phenomenal. I'm, I'm really looking forward to working with her. Um, in the middle of November, uh, right before our next board meeting, um, our new facilities manager will be starting. Our new facilities manager will be Marcos Levy. And he comes from the, the Liberty, uh, Libertyville Library, Cook Memorial, uh, where he oversees two facilities there. Um, prior to his role there, he was facilities manager of the Lake Forest Library for 19 years. Uh, so he has a wealth of knowledge um, in public libraries. He understands what we do. He also has experience managing older buildings. Uh, the Lake Forest Library is a historic building uh, that went through a number of renovations and his experience in working through projects there is gonna be a wealth of, of value to us going forward. So I'm thrilled to be able to bring uh, Marcos into our team um, and to enhance our facility services going forward. Um, but all of that said, the composition of our leadership team is growing and um, there are gonna be, uh, there's certainly a lot of challenges that come with that, but a lot of wonderful opportunities too. So, um, I just wanted to make sure that you're aware of, of all of those changes that are taking place because things are, are unique in the library right now. Um, I could ramble for days, but I'm gonna, I'll pause there again. <laughs> um, so that concludes my report. Any other questions or comments from, from me? Just a comment that uh, the library has certainly been handling everything in a wonderful manner. And I, I think probably 99.9% .9 of the people who have visited have found it a, a good place to be and well managed. So I think we're, we're working towards an even better reputation than we had before by pulling, pe pulling with people who have to go through this pandemic with us all. So thank you and thank you all your staff. We've got a great team. Thank you, Jen. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your leadership, Anthony. And, um, oh, I know you're here. Uh, just some side notes that we should be getting the uh, audit next month, which is up there. And uh, well, I'll wait for new business, but that's one thing which will help in I think with the finance committee and the finance committee will meet at that point in time to talk about the policy once you've got the audit. And the other thing is we should have a copy of the, the annual report should be done next month also. Right, Anthony? Okay. And one of the things that uh, was part of chapter 11 was I had asked Anthony who we partnered with and there were quite a few groups that I had no clue we were partnering with. And I think that might be interesting to highlight that from time to time and show the engagement and the involvement. So that's important. And to share with, you might want to just share that list with the rest of the trustees, because I thought it was a, a good list that Andrea put together. Thank you. Yeah, not even all inclusive. There's, there's far more than that. That's just youth services. Yeah, but I think that would be good to highlight who we're working with to show you're not an island. I have one last thing, and that is that the ILA is going from 1020 to 1022nd, and our Trustee of the Year award to Dr. Rogers will be given at this year's ILA. So, congratulations. It's well deserved. You're here. 
Thank you. Okay, well, that's a great segue. So do you have anything else to add, uh, Jan, regarding ILA? No, actually, okay. there was hardly anything else. <laughs> okay, and ask me anything regarding rails. Sorry, I was muted. Um, uh, no, I don't really have anything specific to add. I would just recommend to anyone who's got questions about public library response uh, plans to, to go to the Rails website, the COVID response um, link that's included in your packet. Um, there's a lot of really great information included there. You can kind of benchmark our library's response against our peers um, on that page. Okay. And so you've covered everything else. It brings us to new business. Does anyone have any new business? Uh, I will be sending you all out an evaluation of Anthony. I'm talking to several people. And we will be meeting in special session after at the November meeting. And so I should probably be going out in probably two weeks. So if you can just send it back to me, I'll compile the results and then we will meet in special session to review Director Austin, okay? After the November meeting. And the other thing is I was supposed to be with the league, but the league's program was canceled last month to, uh, to uh, open up as to how people run for local office. So that program was canceled. So thank you. Any, uh, anybody else have any new business, old business? Okay, that concludes. Can we have a motion to adjourn? I'll motion to adjourn. Stuart, I'll move to adjourn. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, Trustee mm -hmm. Marshy, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Nay. Aye. Happy Halloween. Aye. Aye. Go out and vote and enjoy it all. Oh, and, and Marty, thanks for setting me up for ILA. I'm doing ILA virtually, so that's very cool. So thank you. Oh, you are? Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'll be at Trustee Rogers' uh, oh, me too. Yeah. ceremony yeah. since I. Uh, and I think uh, the three other people that wrote letters, I also invited on his behalf when I put the nomination up. So looking forward Great. to on Thursday. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm doing some programming tomorrow, so in, and Thursday, so. Okay. okay, thank you everyone. Good night, thank, thank you. you. So right. that concludes at 819, bye-bye. Bye. Bye guys, stay well. You too.